Good morning and welcome to the Bowden Church of Christ. I'm so glad you decided to tune in this morning. I hope that you use this video as a guide as you worship with your family at home. Now remember, I know that we're in trying times and it seems as if we're nearing the end of the tunnel. We at least see the light at the end of the tunnel. As many of you have already seen, May the 17th, the elders have said, will be the day we return to uh, somewhat normal services here at Bowden. If you didn't get that email, please contact us and we want to give you as much information as possible. With that being said, let's continue to pray not only for our elders, but for all the people who are working in this crisis as the country begins to reopen. Let's make sure that we're using that powerful avenue of prayer we talked about a few Wednesday nights ago. We're going to be worshiping God this morning, studying from His Word. We're going to be singing praises, and in just a moment we're going to have a prayer. So I hope that you use your time this Sunday morning to worship God, to pour out your love and your adoration to God, and that you really strive today to, to put your focus solely on the Lord. That's at least my prayer. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. We'll sing a few songs, have the Lord's Supper, and then our lesson. And I hope it's an encouragement to you. But let's begin. Let's all go to God in prayer and thank Him for this beautiful day that He's blessed us with. Our Father above, thank You for the moments that You've given us where our life is continuing. Thank You for all the rich blessings that You pour out on us, especially us as Christians, Lord. Thank You for the spiritual blessings that You give us. We know that they are only found in Christ, and we pray that we live our life in such a way that is pleasing to you, um, that we walk in the light each day, and thank you so much for Jesus and uh, the ability he gave us to have our sins forgiven uh, because of his sacrifice and his sinless life. Lord, we pray that as we worship this morning, we do so in spirit and in truth. Help, help each family as they focus their minds on your Son and his death and burial and his resurrection. Help us as we look to your word today to do so with open hearts and minds and with open Bibles. And Lord, thank you so much for the church, especially the church here in Bowden. Continue to watch over us and bless us, be with our, our elders and our leadership. And uh, Lord, we're, just, we're so thankful for all that you do for us. It's through your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We
this morning to prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. I will be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, here, in, here in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth uh, for many different reasons, but one reason in particular, um, the church there had begun to partake of the Lord's Supper in an inappropriate uh, manner. Um, and he had to address this uh, here in, in verse uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. At this time, I just ask that you examine yourself and make sure that you are focusing on these emblems, what they stand for. Now if you will, please bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just so thankful for your perfect Son that you sent to die for us and, and making that awesome sacrifice on our behalf so that we may have the opportunity to come be with you in heaven one day. Father, we ask your blessing on this loaf at this time. Um, ask that you be with each one of us and help us to uh, focus on that awesome sacrifice. And we pray that we do this in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bow with me as we go to God in prayer and ask His blessing on the cup, the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you here once again in a, in a likewise manner. Again, just so thankful for uh, that awesome sacrifice that was made. At this time, we ask your blessing on this cup, which represents your son's precious blood that was shed on our behalf. Just ask that you bless it and be with each one of us as we partake. And we pray that we do these things in a manner that's pleasing to you and according to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Another important part of our worship here is, uh, is our contribution, our giving uh, to the Lord. To get our mind prepared for this, I will be uh, reading from 1 Corinthians again here as well uh, in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes here, uh, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Please bow with me as we go to God in prayer and ask his blessing on the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time just uh, with thankful hearts. We're just so thankful for the, for the many things that we are blessed with here in this country. Father, we pray that we never take the things that we are blessed with here for granted. Help us to always have a giving heart. And Father, we just pray that you be with each member, each individual at this time, uh, as they prepare to give. Just pray that all will give with a cheerful heart. And just pray that, uh, pray that the overseers of this money will distribute it and use it in a way that is pleasing to you and according to your will. It's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to the Bowden Church of Christ for our virtual lesson this morning. My name is Josh Posey. I'm the minister here at this congregation and I'm so glad you've decided to tune in this morning. If you're a part of our congregation, Bowden folks, know that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are nearing, hopefully, the end of our isolation from one another and I hope you find that very encouraging. I appreciate our elders for their sincere thought and their determination to fulfill their role as shepherds most effectively. They have made great decisions and I'm thankful that they continued to do so. We are expecting to be back together on May the 17th. Now of course that could be subject to change due to the state of our county, but I pray that you will look forward to that day as much as I do where we can once again be together versus as we've been doing, worshiping with our families in our homes. If you're not a part of the Bowden congregation, if you're a visitor to this stream, I hope that this lesson is encouraging to you. And I hope that you will, once all of the craziness is over, come visit us here at the Bowden Church of Christ. And I hope you'll come here and find that the people here, just as I have found, are so welcoming and loving and that we strive to do what the Bible says and nothing beyond that. We just want the truth. And so uh, I strive every day to encourage people to come check out this congregation, and I hope you'll do the same thing as well. So thank you for tuning in this morning. Our text is going to begin in Exodus chapter 3, and the groundwork of what we see in Exodus 3 is going to lead us into what we're going to talk about this morning, which I think is a needed subject. Um, this is not necessarily a subject that is directed to every individual in the world. However, it is directed to a very specific group of people. Now, while that may be true, and you'll see what I mean when we begin the lesson, I want every person who hears this lesson to follow the example of 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 when Paul said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. I want all of us to remember how wonderful the mirror of Scripture is, that we can look into it and we can see who we really are. So I encourage you as we study through this morning, this lesson, that no matter where you are in your spiritual walk, no matter where you are in your life, that you will look at these principles and apply them in the appropriate way. We begin in Exodus chapter 3, the story of Moses. You remember Moses was the young boy put into the basket by his mother while Israel were slaves in Egypt. He was found by one of the women of Pharaoh's household, Pharaoh's daughter, and was raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Egypt. Eventually, Moses fled Egypt. He went into the wilderness, was married, began to live out his life. Later, as he is in the wilderness as a shepherd, he comes across a bush that is burning, and he comes to it, and the Lord, uh, the text says the angel of the Lord and God, that they spoke to him through this burning bush. Moses receives from the Lord a specific uh, quest, if you will, a commandment, something God wants him to do. That is, God says to Moses, I've heard the crying out of my people in, in Egypt, the people of Israel. I've heard that they're in slavery and I'm going to deliver them. And Moses, I'm going to deliver them through you. Now, when Moses heard this from God, he was not only very uh, serious about the request, but he was very serious about whether or not he was qualified for this request. In fact, Moses began to tell the Lord why he didn't think he could do it. Now, we're going to talk about excuses this morning, and we're going to talk about them in a very specific way. I want you to know that every time Moses makes an excuse in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, a reason that to Moses was probably justifiable, every single one of these things I believe was a true concern of Moses, a reason why he didn't believe he could do what God was asking him to do, or a reason why he needed more information to do what God was asking him to do, Every time Moses delivered up an excuse as to why he couldn't lead out Israel, God shut that excuse down and told him, No, Moses, this is what I want you to do, and this is what you're going to do. Let me give you a few examples of the excuses that Moses gave. One of them we find in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, when Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses was concerned. By whom authority? Whose authority am I coming? 
If they ask me who sent me, what do I say, Lord? A concern as to why he could not fulfill this task. Another one, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither in past, in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Again, Moses delivers up this reason why he believes he can't complete the task God has set before him. An excuse for not doing what it is that God wants him to do. And excuses are common. There are a dime a dozen in our society, just as they were in Moses' time. We could take the principle of the excuses of Moses and apply it in so many ways. One of the most popular ways we take this and apply it is that we as God's people are asked to, to go out and save the lost, to go out to those who are in slavery to the world, bring them out of slavery to the world under the authority of God, and help them to be delivered from that slavery and be freed by the Lord. We're to be evangelists, to evangelize the world. Now, often we make excuses as to why we can't be more evangelistic, and that would be another lesson for another time. What I want to do, though, is take this idea of Moses' excuses, the things that, that were probably very real to him, the things that he thought were valid, that the Lord said, you know what, this isn't valid. I want you to, con I want you to actually do what I've asked you to do. And I want to apply it to a very special group of people this morning. What about those people in the world who are lost? Have you ever thought about the people who are lost? I'm sure at some point in your life you have. The people out in the world who, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, they have no hope. Uh, it's Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 that tells us that heaven will not be their home. The people who are not in Christ. Those people, we're going to ask the question this morning, why haven't they obeyed the gospel? What is preventing some people from being obedient to the Lord? Now, I think that we could answer this question a number of ways. For instance, some people are not obedient to the Lord because they haven't actually seen an example of a Christian in their life. They've never seen someone who's truly faithful to the Lord, or they've never paid attention to Him, and so being faithful to God, serving the Lord is not really on their radar of things that they should or want to aspire to do. Other people have heard the story of Jesus, but they believe the lies of the world and they've just bought into what atheism or agnosticism teaches us. That God, nothing can be proven about Him or God just plain out doesn't exist. Some people are lost because they have heard and seen things that turned them away from Jesus, and that's no more Jesus' fault than their own. However, they've let circumstances keep them from being Christians. Whatever the case may be, there's a lot of reasons that we could say some people are lost. And, and let me tell you, before we even get into this lesson, the number one solution to people who are lost being saved is God's people standing up and doing something. It's the principle in Ezekiel, the watchman who sees the army coming and turns around to the city and warns them of the coming doom. And that's what the Christian is. We're watchmen. We're to see the danger of sin and see the destructiveness of sin and ultimately through God's word, see the, the ending point of sin that will be eternally separated from God. And we're to see that and then warn everyone we can that God wants us to change so that we can be saved. So there's a lot of reasons that people are lost, and I believe us as Christians, we have a lot of responsibility in that. It is our job to go to the lost and to tell them about Jesus. But that's not what we're going to address this morning. What I want to talk about for the few minutes that we have remaining is not why are people lost. No, we're going to take this from the perspective of Moses. We're going to ask, why do lost people say that they stay lost? In other words, why would someone say that they haven't become a Christian yet? Because as we're studying through this, you may be listening on the other end of this camera. You see, I'm, I'm just preaching to a camera this morning. The auditorium around me is empty. But I want you to know that I know in a few days... A few hours, you're going to be watching this video and you may be sitting on the couch or sitting in your car or listening to this on your phone while you're driving and you may be someone who has not obeyed the gospel and you may have said one of the things we're going to study about this morning and if that's the case, I want you to know that the Lord, He doesn't want us to put off obedience to Him. Obedience is, is very important. In fact, our soul stands in the balance 
of whether or not we submit to God or not. And so if you're in that case this morning and you have not submitted to God, you've not become a Christian, I want you to know that I hope something in this lesson will prick your heart. I hope that something that God's Word says will turn you to think about more than just the here and now, but ultimately your eternity with God. So, why, why are the lost lost? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but why would they say they're lost? Here's a few of the things I've heard before in my life that I want to address this morning, and the lesson will be yours. The first, some people say that they are not Christians yet. Some people have not obeyed the gospel. They say, you know what, I'm going to wait. That's something I want to do, but I don't want to take care of that uh, quite yet. There are other things I want to take care of. I'm going to wait on that. I'm not going to do it now. You know, procrastination is one of Satan's greatest weapons in our life. Putting something off, failing to address something, Satan uses that in so many ways against us, and he rejoices every time we use it, no matter what stage of life we're in. I found this neat little illustration about obedience to the Lord that I want to share with you that you'll probably resonate with this in some way because uh, many of you have been in these stages. Why do certain people not obey the Lord? Here's different age groups. This is an illustration. The 12-year-old says they delayed in obeying by saying, I'm much too young to think about God. The 18-year-old says, I'm much too smart to think about God. The 22-year-old says, I'm much too happy to think about God. The 25-year-old says, I'm much too busy to think about God. The 30-year-old says, I'm much too smug to think about God. The 40-year-old, I'm much too tired to think about God. The 50-year-old says, I'm too worried to think about God. And the 60 and above say, well, I'm just too old to think about God. You know, in reality, our life is very short. It's James who, in fact, says our life is but a vapor. It is here for a little while, and then it vanishes away. The ESV says our life is but a mist. It's like a fog that stands for a moment, but as soon as the sun's rays and the UV hits it, it dissipates and dissolves, and that's what our life is like. We know how short our life is and how unexpectedly death can come. Many of you have experienced that in your families or your friend groups or in your extended uh, acquaintances. You know how frail and how quick and unexpectedly life can end. We should never use the weapon that Satan has against us of saying, you know, I'm just going to deal with that later. I'm just going to take care of that later. I, I don't want to deal with that right now. I'm just going to take care of that later. We should understand how foolish it is to wait on things when it comes to putting gas in your car. I'm one of the world's worst about putting gas in my truck. I, I run it down very low. My wife always gets on to me, Morgan. She's always telling me I need to put gas in my car. Why are you waiting to put gas in your truck? You know, you need to go get gas. But here's the reality. I don't wait until it goes empty to put it in. I, I get it in the car. You see, I don't delay putting it in there until I'm sitting on the side of the road with no gas. I always get it in there. You see, we, we shouldn't delay something until the point of it inconveniencing us or hurting us. We don't do that with groceries. We don't put off getting groceries, even though our family may be hungry. We may say, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll do groceries tomorrow. I'm not going to do it today. I know we don't have anything to eat, but I'm just going to put that off to tomorrow. Or changing the oil in the car or marrying the love of our life. We don't say, you know what, uh, I know that's important, but I'm going to do it later. You see, things that are important, we do now. What's important to us, we take care of now. It was Paul, who was called Saul when he was first introduced to Jesus. He hated him. When he was introduced to, to Christians, he hated them. He killed them. He bound them and put them in prison. But it was after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus that he was in a room praying when a man by the name of Ananias came in and asked him, Saul, why do you wait? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, we all don't delay things that are important for our physical body. Eating, sleeping, we don't put those things off when it's detrimental to us. We take care of those things. But Matthew 10 and verse 28 says that we shouldn't worry about him who should kill the body, but him who should kill who can kill both body and soul in hell. That is, my body is not important as my spiritual state. Why would I put off something so valuable? My soul's at stake. So maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, you know what, Josh? I've been thinking that waiting is the best option. Let me encourage you. 
with the same words of Ananias. What are you waiting on? What is it that's standing between you and obeying the Lord? Why do you wait? Number two, the second thing I've heard people say, I don't know enough yet. Some people say, I'm not becoming a Christian. I, I'm not going to be obedient to God because I just don't know enough yet. I've heard this time and time again. Now, a desire for you to learn more is very commendable. Don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I want you to always be a student. Every Christian should always be a student. However, there is a lot to learn and you're never going to know it all. Being a Christian is a process that involves growth. It's in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18 that Peter says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2 and verse 42 says, or Luke 2.52 says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Growth is a part of God's plan. He plans for a child to be born and to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until they're a full mature adult. God's plan is the same for a Christian. They're born into life through the new birth. They're born again as a Christian. And they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow into a mature Christian. That's God's plan. But listen, when you're born into the world as a baby, or you're born into this spiritual state as a babe in Christ, you're not going to know everything. In fact, you're going to know very little compared to what you will know one day. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, when Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. It's Matthew 28 that uses the word sometimes nations. Teach all nations. And he says, Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 28 Verse 19, I believe I'm mixing up Matthew 28 and Mark 16 here in my mind. Matthew chapter 28. Yeah, Matthew 28. That's right. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. He says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's what he said. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them. And he says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20. This is the verse I wanted to get to. It took me a minute, but here we are. Verse 20 teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You see, the prescription in the Bible, according to Matthew 28, is teach, baptize, teach. Did you catch that? Go into the world and make disciples. You've got to teach to make disciples. Baptize. That's a part of the conversion process. That's when you contact the blood of Jesus. That's, that's the moment of obedience that puts you into Christ. It's not the only step, but it's one of them. Baptize. And then he says, teach. Teach, baptize, teach. So you're going to learn some, then you're going to obey the gospel, and then you're going to learn a whole lot more. What you learn here is nowhere near as much as what you're going to learn on this side. Teach, baptize, teach. You see, some people say, well, I don't know enough, but a Christian is going to know very little. You may ask yourself, what do I need to know? I, I know of no better place to tell you what you need to know than Acts chapter 2. Here's the thing. If we do what they did, we become what they were. What they did was obey the gospel. They became Christians. So if we obey the gospel, we can become Christians. We look in Acts chapter 2, and these are the first Christians. So what did they need to know in order to become Christians? In order to be a part of the childhood of God. What did they need to know? Here's what Paul mentions in Acts chapter 2. First of all, you need to know that you're lost in your sins, and that's exactly what this whole sermon was about. He said, concluding in verse 36, you need to know that for certain, Jesus has been made both Lord and Christ. And at the end of verse 36, Paul says of Acts chapter 2, of whom you crucified. He put the sin on their shoulders. You have crucified him. So we got to know that we're in sin. Sin, according to Isaiah 59, is that thing that drives a wedge. Imagine sin as a wedge, and it drives a wedge between me and the Lord. It separates us. We want to get rid of that wedge. We don't want to be separated from God. We want to be brought back to Him. And, and sin is what's keeping us. So we've got to figure out how to get rid of that. And so Peter preaches this entire sermon all about Jesus. Jesus' works. Him 
in His resurrection, Him sitting on the throne of David just as was promised in 2 Samuel 7, and Him ultimately rising from the dead and the Spirit being poured out on all people, just like the Bible says, according to all these scriptures He quotes, everything about Jesus is true. And so He said, you need to know Jesus that Jesus is the solution to your sins. I know that he's saying that because in verse 36 he says that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Lord means that he's the king of the kingdom. Just before that he said he's sitting on the throne. Jesus is sitting on the throne of his kingdom today. The kingdom is the church. And he says he has made him both Lord and Christ. He's made him the Messiah. The Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. The one to bridge the gap between man and God and bring them back together. The one who lived a spotless life and died as the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 5 talks about him as the Lamb of God who stood up and was able to open the scroll sealed with the seven seals. He is the one that saved us. And Peter says that Jesus is who you need to know. There's not a million things you need to know before you're a Christian. I know that it may feel that way. I had a friend tell me one time that he obeyed the gospel as a young man and throughout his life time and time again he would learn more and he would say there was no way I knew enough to be a Christian. And he was baptized again. And then he would learn for another two years and he'd be like, man, I didn't know enough. He was, and that happened time and time again. He was baptized and baptized and baptized and baptized until finally he realized, I'm always going to know more. <laughs> Folks, if you stop learning, you're dying. As a Christian, you're always going to learn. So when you say, I don't know enough, all you need to know is what I just told you. Jesus died for you. He's sitting on the throne of His church today, which He died for, Matthew 16 and verse 18. Your sins can be put away. That's all you need to know. Don't listen to people tell you that you need to understand the history of the church and you need to understand every aspect of, of the church and that you need to have a full understanding of sin and you need to have a full understanding of every sin that could ever be committed and you need to be fully mature to where you'll never turn back to them. None of that's true. You need to know about Jesus. We'll get you beyond that after that. We'll teach you. We'll study the Bible. We, we meet three times a week just for that purpose. Don't let the fact that you don't know enough be the reason that keeps you from Jesus. So, number two, I don't know enough. Number three, some people say, number one, I'm going to wait. I, that's just not something I'm going to deal with right now. I, I'm going to put that off. I'll do that eventually. Other people say, number two, I don't know enough. I don't have enough knowledge yet. Yet, there are still some that say, number three, you know, I want to wait to make sure I can live the Christ, Christian life. Excuse me. I want to wait to make sure I can live the Christian life. I'm not good enough yet. I want to improve my, wife, my life. I want to make sure that I've got it together. You know, that implies, I believe, a very strong misunderstanding about what Christianity is. Living the Christian life is not about having it all together. Shame on people who make it that way. Shame on people who make it about having everything together. Because the people who think they have it all together are full of so much pride, they can't see that Jesus is the only one that can do that for you. Jesus is the only one that can put all the problems and the pieces of life together to make it meaningful and worth something. Without Him, our life is pointless. It has no purpose. So some people say, I want to make sure that I can live up to Christianity. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to count the cost. Christianity requires a lot of you. But what you give is nothing compared to what you get. Some people may say, Christianity isn't about what you get. I don't believe that. It is. Because if I wasn't getting eternal life, if I wasn't having my sins forgiven, if I wasn't able to be with God, it wouldn't be worth a thing. If there wasn't something that I was doing this for, I would never do it. So yes, there is a reason you obey the gospel. There's a purpose behind it. But it's not the purpose of you being perfect. The only thing that makes us perfect is Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 reminds me of this growth process that we've been talking about some in this lesson. Beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, but you weren't ready for it. And even now you're not ready. 
For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another one, I Apollos, are you not merely being human? Notice, he writes this to brothers, chapter 3 and verse 1, but he says, you're still behaving as humans. The thing is, we're not going to have it all together as soon as we come up out of that water. There are things we're going to have to grow into and understand and, 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 and be more careful in. We're going to learn lessons as Christians down the road. That's just the way it's going to be. Don't let the idea that you can't be perfect stand in the way of you becoming actually perfect before God because Jesus is the answer to that. Christian life, our Christian life is about growth. You say, I can't live the Christian life without Christ. People say, well, I, I want to make sure I can do everything. I can, I can do just right what God wants me to, but I can't do what God wants me to unless I'm in Christ. I'm living according to the flesh without Christ. I cannot do what God wants me to unless I have Jesus. And that's Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, when Paul says this. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. A man's life cannot be reformed outside of Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Now, he's not saying there is no condemnation for those who are perfect. He's not saying there's no condemnation for those who have the righteous and high mighty attitude of I've got it all right and you've got it all wrong and hey, you better come listen to me because I've got everything just right. That's not what Christianity is about. Paul doesn't say there's no condemnation for those who are right. What he says is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You see, I can't live a reformed life outside of Christ. I can't live a life that's changed. He says, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. I won't be free from the law of sin without Jesus. For God has done what the, what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The, the, the law couldn't make us perfect, but He sent His own Son to make us perfect. He said, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You and I cannot be justified outside of Christ. You're not going to live a perfect life without Jesus. And you're not going to live a perfect life until you have Jesus. And you're not going to live a perfect life in Jesus. Jesus is the thing that's going to make you perfect. How beautiful is the doctrine of the redemption of Jesus. You see, when I delay in obeying Jesus' commands until I have my life in order, I'm putting the cart before the horse. God wants me to be obedient to Him so I can get it all together. We can't say, well, I'll wait to get it all together, and then I'll get it all together. No, Jesus puts it all together. So some people say, I, I want to make sure that I'm living the right way. Other people say this, there are hypocrites in the church. This is number four. There are hypocrites in the church. Now, true, there are hypocrites in the church, but there's hypocrites everywhere. There's hypocrites in your PTA clubs, in your uh, civic clubs, at your golf uh, courses, uh, in your friend group. There's, there's hypocrites everywhere. It's, it's just a reality of life, okay? I, I once heard somebody say this, does a hypocrite being at a football stadium keep you from going to watch the game? No, of course it doesn't. You see, the sin of hypocrisy is no excuse for you and I to keep, keep sinning. You say, oh, well, the hypocrites are over there, so I don't even want anything of Jesus. I'm just going to die in my sins and go to hell because I don't want to be around the hypocrites. Here's my question. I'm going to ask this as delicately as possible, but let me, let me put it very plainly to you. Where else do you want the hypocrites to be? Would we rather than be in the world, die and go to hell? Or would we rather than be in the pews, hearing God's word week in and week out with an opportunity to respond to the gospel and change? Where else do we want the hypocrites to be? Because if we say we don't want them in the church, then we're hypocrites by going to the church. Because if we don't think every person desires to be, deserves to be saved, every person deserves the grace of Jesus. Every person does. Now, it doesn't mean they've earned it, but Jesus died so they could have it. I want everyone to be saved, just like Jesus that He desires for all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He wouldn't that any would perish. That's God's desire. My desire needs to meet God's desire. Some other things to remember. Do we think that Peter, James, and John and the rest of the apostles stopped hanging out with Jesus because Judas was a hypocrite amongst them? Oh, Judas was with the apostles, so hey, if he was with Jesus, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. That doesn't, that doesn't fit. Don't let hypocrisy come between you and the Lord. Don't let the hypocrite become bigger than God. Yes, hypocrites are in the church, but that's exactly where I want them. 
And you should too. Some people say they don't obey the gospel because there's hypocrites. Other people say that they're waiting on their spouse or their parents or their girlfriend or their boyfriend to obey. They're waiting on that. But my question is, that's number five, they're waiting on somebody. What help am I giving them by waiting? It's in 1 Peter chapter 3 that Peter writes to those who are women married to non-Christians. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, he tells them, no, not to wait on their spouses to become Christians. He tells these Christian women who are married to non-Christians, be faithful. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they will be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see their, respect, their respectful and pure conduct. When I live my life before other people as a Christian, it is a powerful influence for the good. Don't delay obeying the gospel. Because someone in your family hasn't. Don't delay obeying the gospel because you've learned that maybe a family member obeyed a gospel that wasn't from God in a denomination. Don't let that keep you from obeying the gospel. It's Romans chapter 14 and verse 12 that tells us we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says that God's going to bring all our deeds into judgment. You're going to answer for you and you alone. Don't let someone else determine whether your soul is saved or lost. You know, there may be so many other reasons or excuses or objections that somebody might say, these are the reasons I haven't obeyed the gospel. But I hope what I've looked at tonight, the things that we have studied, have been helpful for you in determining, okay, I'm not going to let these things stand in my way anymore. Remember the excuses of Moses? Moses said, Lord, I can't do it. And he gave, ultimately, in Exodus 3 and 4, he gave four excuses as to why he could not go and do what the Lord had asked him to do. And the Lord shut down every one of them. I'm here to tell you tonight, this morning, that the Lord is ready and willing to show you that whatever excuse may come in your life for not obeying the gospel, it's not worth it. And just as Moses, who made excuses, was used by the Lord for great things, you become an instrument in the hand of God as you are a faithful Christian. Great things will happen for him through you. God, he uses great faithful men and women for great purposes. So, have you obeyed the gospel? If not, why are you waiting?